Well, hello everybody. This is the Gospel of Mark study, and we are in number 22 today, and that's going to take us to Mark chapter 9, and we are going to be dealing with verses 30 through 32. Now, I originally had intended to deal with a much bigger chunk, and uh, last time we met, uh, I really wanted to deal with Mark 9, 30, all the way through 41. But there's just so much packed in these verses that I felt like, you know, it would be doing a disservice to the text of Scripture, to the Word of God, to just rush through this and try to cover such a, a, a big uh, uh, span of material. And so I, I, I have kind of broken this down, and today we're going to uh, not be able to cover it as well. We're going to find ourselves really in verses 30. Uh, down through 32 and uh, dealing with something I think is really interesting which is um, why it was that the disciples just couldn't seem to grasp what Jesus was telling them about his future death and I think there's some important spiritual truths for us to mine out of this passage that can be very helpful for us helpful for us uh, even as we think about our future, um, you know, when we think about uh, the truth of the Word of God, and it talks about certain things in, in general terms about our future, and some of those things, we'll talk about them in just a little bit, um, do have a tendency to scare some believers. And uh, we need to recognize that God never operates contrary to his word. And so when we're told that we are to speak the truth in love, God does the same thing for us. And there are truths that are scary. There are truths that are concerning. If we have a heart for God, a heart for his word, a desire to please him, and if we have a spiritual, biblically informed self-awareness in which we recognize that we still struggle with sin, and that we will struggle with sin until that day when we cross into glory, that that causes us to recognize that even though our sin has been paid for at the cross, our sin still has an effect upon our lives in the sense of our service for the Lord, uh, which is going to uh, be brought forth at the judgment seat of Christ. You know, the judgment seat of Christ is not a judgment in which we are judged for sin because Christ has already been judged in our place for our sin. However, it, it must be realized that even our sin, which has been completely cared for at the cross of Calvary so that we will not be condemned with unbelievers, that sin still has had an impact upon how we have lived our lives, how we have used our time, how we have used our resources, uh, how we have served the Lord. So as, as an example, you know, I, I have been a pastor much of my adult life, and I could go into church on a Sunday and preach just the greatest sermon in all the world. I mean, just be biblically on target, be, uh, you know, just uh, operating on all eight cylinders and, and see you know, just a bunch of people come to the Lord that Sunday. See a lot of believers uh, turn their, uh, you know, rededicate their lives to Christ or what have you. But, you know, say before the service, I got in a fight with Nancy, you know, and I, I was doing something I shouldn't have done, and I got angry. I was selfish. And instead of repenting of that sin and confessing that sin to the Lord and making things right with Nancy, I just went to church to preach my sermon. Well, you know, that sin has been taken care of at the cross of Calvary. Yes, it has. I'm not going to be condemned for that sin or those sins that I committed against my wife. However, those sins still have an impact upon my ministry for that day. And so great things could have happened uh, as a result of that sermon, as a result of God using his word. But, you know, maybe not such great things happen because of the holiness in my own life, and perhaps I will experience loss of reward because I had not dealt with my sin in a biblical way which honored the Lord. So again, my sin does not condemn me, but certainly sin does have an impact on 
the rewards we, we receive or lose at the judgment seat of Christ. You know, if, if, if you're a believer and you spend uh, a, a, um, uh, an amount of time involved in, in some kind of sinful practice, some kind of besetting sin, well, that time that is spent pursuing that sin is time that you have lost for service to the king, and therefore there's a loss reward. So again, you're not judged for your sin because sin has paid it all, because Christ has paid it all. <laughs> Let me make sure I say that right. Christ has paid it all. But that sin does have bearing upon how you have used your life for Jesus Christ and service to him, and that's going to have bearing upon rewards uh, gained and rewards lost at the judgment seat of Christ. So we know we're going to stand before the judgment of Christ. We're going to give an account for our lives, and, and sometimes that's a fearful thing. But we need to recognize that that truth does not need to be fearful now. Right now we can be afraid of that because we don't have the grace right now to, to deal with that. We don't even have all the information about what that judgment will look like. But on the day that we stand before Christ, our Savior, who will judge our service to him. He will be the one who's seated on that Bema seat throne. He will give us, equip us with that grace that is necessary to move through that judgment for his glory and for our eternal joy, okay? So we get the warning now and the warning scares us. And if we dwell too much on that warning, we, we could be petrified. But we need to recognize that the warning is given to inform us that there is a day coming in our future when we will stand before the Lord and we will give an account of our lives to the Lord. But it's not meant to petrify us, not meant to uh, horrify us or to scare us. Uh, it is meant to, to inform us. Um, but, you know, this is not the day that we're going to stand before Christ. Therefore, we don't have the grace we need today to deal with that event. On the day that event takes place, God will give us his grace so that we will go through that day of judgment really unscathed. He always speaks the truth with love. And so we need to recognize that, and especially so as we come to this passage and see what's going on with the disciples and with Jesus. So again, we're going to be in Mark chapter 9, and let's pick up there with verse 30. They left that place, so this is the disciples and Jesus. They have left uh, where they were up in the northeast part of Israel, of Galilee, and they're passing through Galilee, and they are heading toward Capernaum, okay? So this is going to be uh, probably a long journey. It's, it's probably going to be at least a, a really long day, if not a day and a half. And uh, they passed through Galilee, and Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He is teaching them things that they need to know about him and about them and about the future, okay? And so he wants to get them away from the crowd so he can teach them these things. So he does not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. So we're, we're, we're back in one of those cases where Jesus is informing them about the future, and he's informing them about the future in general terms. He's not getting very specific here. But even the general terms are, are hard and extremely difficult for the disciples to accept. And in fact, it says here, they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. So in, in looking at, at, at verse 32 and in trying to grapple just a little bit deeper with, with the disciples' reaction to Jesus' declaration, that he's going to be delivered into the hands of men and executed and then three days later rise from the dead. Why is it that it just seems so hard for them to understand what Jesus is saying? Well, we saw in our last study that that word delivered was a very important word. It, it had the idea of 
someone being delivered up to men who were in a position of authority, such as civil leaders, who had the authority to try you, find you guilty, and then execute some kind of punishment against you. And in some cases, that punishment could be the death penalty, execution. And so um, this is really what is troubling these guys. They just can't imagine, as they're looking at Jesus right now, that, that in the future, in, in just a few short months, in, in several weeks, that Jesus is going to be charged with a crime that is going to necessitate his execution. That, that is just the farthest thing from their minds. I mean, just imagine someone that, that you greatly respect. So maybe it's your pastor, maybe it's a Sunday school teacher, maybe it's a, uh, just a, a Christian uh, friend or leader that you just hugely respect and you know them very well, you've known them for years, and, and then this person tells you that in a few weeks that they're going to be arrested and that they are actually going to be found guilty of a capital crime and they are going to then be executed for that crime. Now, let me ask you, would you find that a little hard to believe? Would you find that a little hard to accept? Well, that's where these guys are. That's why they don't understand what Jesus is really talking about. And keep in mind that they also knew that Jesus is the Messiah. They, they believed that. They accepted that. And there's no way in the world they could see that God would allow his Messiah to be executed, especially upon a cross. Now, again, the only people who had the authority to execute people in Israel were the Romans. And the Romans executed people using the cross. That was considered a tree. And the only one who died on a tree in Israel was someone whom God cursed. So how could God let his Messiah die on a tree at the hands of the Romans and be such that God curses him? That, that just doesn't make any sense in their theology. Well, that's where the disciples are. They can't imagine Jesus being arrested, found guilty, and then executed. It just doesn't make any sense to them. And then you throw in the part about him rising from the dead, and they're really wondering, what in the world is Jesus talking about? But notice that Jesus does not address their confusion. Uh, he doesn't address their lack of understanding, and he doesn't uh, deal with their inability to understand what Jesus is saying to them. I, and I think um, this is important. Why doesn't Jesus address this? Why, why doesn't he deal with this? Uh, and I think that Luke, in his account of this same event, which we could find in Luke chapter 9, verses 44 through 45, really gives us some insight into why Jesus does not address their lack of understanding. Luke chapter 9 and verses 44 through 45. Um, look what it says in, in verse 45. Look at Luke 9 verse 45. This is after Jesus has said essentially what he just said here in Mark 9. This is the same event. And Jesus has said the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men but they did not understand what this meant. They didn't understand, again, that he's going to be delivered in the hands of men. They understand what delivered meant. It meant that he was going to be delivered over for trial and execution. That they couldn't understand why that was, was what Jesus is talking about. But notice in verse 45, it says, but they did not understand what this meant. It was hidden from them so that they did not grasp it and they were afraid to ask him about it. Okay, so the reason they don't understand it, the reason they don't grasp it, is not just because of their lack of spiritual maturity, their lack of understanding of the Old Testament. It's being hidden from them. So there's this divine action going on in their hearts and minds that is not allowing them to grasp the full uh, details, the big picture and all of the details that make up that picture of what Jesus is talking about in regard to his upcoming arrest, trial, crucifixion, atonement for the sins of those who will believe in Christ, and then his resurrection from the dead to prove that God the Father is satisfied with the sacrifice that Christ became for sinners who will believe. Okay? So, they're unable to understand and they're unable to understand 
because it's hidden from them so that they did not grasp it. So, the, so even though Jesus is speaking plainly to them, the disciples just don't get it. And the reason they don't get it is because it's being hidden from them. Now, the word hidden is a translation of a Greek word, which, which means to veil or to hide or to conceal something, to, to cause something that should be seen to be unseen, okay? Um, you, you could also be distracting people from seeing what is obvious. That could be part of the meaning of this word as well. But the idea is that there is an action occurring in their hearts and minds that's keeping them from being able to understand what Jesus is, is telling them, okay? And of course, Luke is insinuating that the one hiding and concealing the meaning of what Jesus is saying to his disciples is, is, is God, and I think probably the Holy Spirit of God. But, but why? Why would God, and I am presuming again God the Holy Spirit, uh, is not letting this information get through? Why is, is this taking place? Why is he not letting it sink into the disciples' minds so that they can fully understand what is going to happen to Jesus in the future and why it must happen, okay? I, I think one of the keys to answering this question uh, may be found in Matthew's account of this same event. We've got to put all three of these together, Matthew, Mark, and Luke's account of the same event, which we find in Matthew 17, verses 22 through 23. Using basically the same language that Mark and you, Luke use in their account, Matthew adds this helpful comment in verse 23. Listen to what he says. And the disciples were filled with grief. So after Jesus tells them he's going to be delivered up to men, um, he's going to be tried, he's going to be executed, he's going to rise the third day. The disciples were filled with grief. The, the word grief, in fact, the whole phrase filled with grief is, 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 is pregnant with meaning, poignant with meaning. It explodes with meaning when you really understand what the phrase is talking about. The idea is that they were deeply grieved to the point that this grief was overwhelming them when they heard Jesus tell them that he was going to be delivered into the hands of men who would kill him and on the third day he would be raised to life. In other words, they were so deeply and so heavily depressed by this news. And that's what the word means. It has the idea of depression being made heavy in spirit, heavy in your soul. So, so they're heavily depressed by this news and they're so deeply and so heavily, heavily, heavily depressed, not heavenly, heavily depressed, that it threatens to consume them, to paralyze them. Almost the, the kind of depression that, that, that keeps you from getting up in the morning. I don't know if any of you have ever experienced that kind of a depression, that just kind of a deep uh, sense of depression that, that really just shuts everything down. And that's what, what they are threatened by right now. That's what they are beginning to experience. And, and so the Greek words that Matthew uses um, in this phrase, filled with grief, uh, are reflecting a heaviness of emotion. Again, what we would call depression and or discouragement. That, that's really over the top. It's beyond degree, beyond comprehension beyond the ability to deal with, okay? So this is really some heavy stuff here. So these guys are really in a bad place as they are contemplating what Jesus is telling them, and, and they're just not able to deal with this. They're just not spiritually at a place where they can deal with what Jesus is saying to them right then, okay? They can't deal with it right then. Then, and that, that's a key thought, right then, okay? At this point in time, they can't deal with this truth, okay? The, the grace they need to deal with this truth is not going to be provided until the truth becomes a reality. As a warning, grace is not provided for it at this point, and so they don't understand it. Now, in just a few months, they're going to have to deal with this, but not now. They weren't ready to deal with it now. And in all honesty, they, they really are going to have a hard time dealing with it when the information does become reality at the cross. And we know that story when they all leave, they all desert Christ. But, but at least they're not going to be blindsided by this truth because Jesus is telling them right now, in general terms, this is what's going to happen. And, and they would remember this after the fact, okay? 
But here, a few months out, here prior to that event taking place, they're not spiritually ready for this information, but they still need to hear it because they're going to need to know about it later on. But they're still not ready for it, okay? And they don't have the grace to deal with it right now. So according to Luke's account, um, this, this full information, unadulterated meaning and understanding of what Jesus is saying to them is hidden from them. And the idea is it's actually blocked out of their minds so they can't even grasp it. it they can't grapple with it, okay? Um, and, and that's interesting what, what the Holy Spirit of God is doing there. He's just not letting it get in, okay? That, that they're going to have a memory of it, but he's not letting them really have to deal with it right now. Um, because even thinking about it is causing them to be overwhelmingly paralyzed with grief, let alone if they had to grapple with it for any length of time at all, okay? Now, notice Jesus doesn't chastise them for their depression. He doesn't uh, chastise them for their lack of understanding or the fact that they're not spiritually mature enough to deal with this information. Rather, he has amazing sympathy for them and on them. And instead of giving them the future in all of its color, its details, and its, its uh, uh, specifics, he holds back he gives them a general overview of what's going to happen. And then I think the Holy Spirit conceals and veils their minds and veils their minds from what they're being tempted to conjure up so that their depression and anxiety over this information does not, in fact, cripple them. Okay, there's a tendency that it could do that. They, they, they feel the prick of the needle, but they don't feel all of it going in. Okay, in essence, the Lord himself hid it from them because there was just too much for them to bear. So the Lord allowed their self-protective disbelief to shelter them and shield them from too great a sorrow and too great an anxiety that would have literally turned them into people suffering from ongoing panic attacks until the day Jesus actually did die on the cross. And of course, it says at the end of Mark 9, 32, they were afraid to ask him about what Jesus had just said. They didn't want any more information, and Jesus doesn't give them any more information. And this is really one of God's mercies, I think, that we don't know the future, and especially our future. Listen, that's a sweet mercy, folks, because if you and I knew the future, uh, we wouldn't and we really couldn't enjoy life because we know that our future is going to end in sadness. I mean, we're all going to die somehow. Now, yes, we'll be released as believers into glory, but still that act of dying is still a sad thing. It's still a, a fearful thing, especially if you don't know how you're going to die. But think about if you knew how you were going to die. I mean, if you really knew how you're going to die, I mean, that would cause you to, to really live a life that probably would not be as joyful and as pleasant as it can be right now. And so we don't know all the details of our future because we can't handle that kind of information. We will be able to handle it on the day that we die when God's grace is sufficient for us in our time of need, but not until that day. And see, that's where the disciples are. They, they were getting this information. This information was threatening to put them over the top. And so God hides the rest of it from them. He distracts them. He moves them on into life. They have this general idea of what's going to happen, but not all the details, and they don't get the details until God's grace meets them at that point of need. They couldn't handle more than they were living in at the moment, and neither can we. I can't handle more than I am living in at the moment, and it's the sweet mercy of the Lord that I only know what I need to know for now. I don't need to know the future. I don't want to know the future. The Lord doesn't give me any more details than I can handle right now, Matthew 6, 33, uh, and on. And someday down the road, as it all unfolds, it unfolds, it's going to make sense to me. It really will at the right time. Remember Jesus on the road to Emmaus with those disciples, and he, he explains the story to them, and he says, didn't I tell you all this? You, you, you couldn't understand it, but now it's happened. You can understand it. They could understand it better then because there was no more fear because it had already taken place. And so here's this grace that meets them in their time of need. Jesus always communicates truth with love. Speak the truth in love. And so he speaks the truth to us. And even when the truth might scare us, we have to keep in mind that when the truth becomes reality, we will meet God's grace at that point in time so that that truth can be born with joy. Um, and, and that's how God does it. And I think we see that in this passage right here. Um, 
Now, before we move on, I think there's something else that's important for us to see here in the story. Jesus' words, which, which were truth and specifically the facts about what was going to happen to him in the near future, resulted in bringing the disciples to the end of themselves as they experienced this overwhelming depression at the thought of what Jesus was saying to them in just small bites. Um, and, and, and sometimes, you know, that, that happens to us. Again, I mentioned as I began the study today that sometimes we are fearful of the judgment seat of Christ. Um, and we really shouldn't be. First John uh, 4 makes the point that we should not be fearful of that event, okay? And as we grow in Christ, I think we, we come to terms with that. But, you know, again, there, there is going to be a rewards. There's going to be loss of rewards. There's going to be an accounting given to the Lord for how we have served him. Again, it's not a judgment to determine our eternal destiny. That was determined at the cross. But it is a, a judgment which, which does determine uh, the gaining and loss of rewards and uh, perhaps privileges and responsibilities in the eternal state. I, we don't have all the details on that. God gives us this information in general terms. And sometimes that can be scary for some believers. But listen, when that day comes, guess what? You're going to have the grace. You're going to have everything that you need to get through that day. So don't be afraid of that day. The one who sits on that throne is our Savior, the one who loves us, the one who went to the cross and gave his life up for us that we might be redeemed. God's truth is always given to us, his people, with love and in love. And we see his love here in uh, Mark 9, uh, 30 through 32, in that when the disciples were about to be overwhelmed with this information, the Holy Spirit comes and intervenes in the midst of their moving into a deep depression, and he conceals what was causing that, delivers from them from that, really by distracting them with life itself. And there is a promise that on the day that they will have to go through that, God's grace will be sufficient for them. There's a whole lot more in here, but we're out of time, so we'll talk some more next time. God bless. Bye.